Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back again to class. So hope you guys are doing good. Just get comfortable. we got a few minutes, and then we will uh, take care of today's meeting for everybody. You guys are having a good week. Pretty interesting stuff happening in the news with the election and everything. So a lot of things to distract us, I guess. But here we are. So welcome back. <clears throat> hey there, Megan. Good to see you. Hey, Rose. Nice. Good to see you, too. Good afternoon slash evening to everybody. Hey, Fernanda. <clears throat> hey there, Nick. Hey Joshua, hey Alec, good to see you guys. <clears throat> hey Eduardo. Neither am I. Good afternoon. Hey, Ryan. <clears throat> Eden. All right, guys. So it's four o'clock. I'm going to let us go ahead and get started. Welcome back. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending and just um, sticking with the class so far. Um, we're making progress through the semester. So we just have, you know, couple more weeks and a couple more chapters of the book to cover. Um, I wanted to just sort of start off today with some quick um, mention of the next homework assignment. Have you guys all noticed the message that I sent to you through the announcements uh, for the class? Who can tell me that you've seen those recent announcements? Let me see, just making sure that there's no issues on that. Okay, good. So there's a third homework assignment. It's scheduled due next Tuesday, okay? So you've got still five more days to work on it over the weekend. And basically, this is a homework assignment that's testing your understanding of fallacies one last time. But it's also bringing the fallacy topic to, uh, to bear on how we you know, consume information in the media and marketing and advertising. So I'm asking you guys to find uh, examples of fallacies in advertisements. Advertisements, commercials, either print, digital, um, you know, whether they're uh, commercials that are like you know, shown on television or that they have versions of online, or if you find something in a digital or a print ad, all you got to do is compile um, 20 of them, hopefully, because we've studied 20 different fallacies. And um, whenever you find an example of a fallacy in some ad, you just have to kind of find a way to uh, collect it and then bundle them all together. And you're going to try and give me those 20 on, on Tuesday before uh, 4 o'clock. Now, you can't use the same fallacy more than once. So that's something I mentioned in the instructions. Since we're all here together right now, I just wanted to kind of make sure everything's clear. So you can't use the same fallacy uh, multiple times. So it's not like you could turn into me uh, 20 different advertisements that are all about the naturalistic fallacy. You know, like So you've got to basically, when you're done with one and have a clear example, it's on to the next and then just try and get all of them. Um, for each one that you do correctly, you'll get five points. Um, and so five times 20 is 100. So that's how you could get another 100 points towards your um, final grade and for the class. Um, so yeah, uh, you some of you might want to use, like I was saying, um, video ads that you see online. And if so, I would just ask you to include the link in your submission to me so that I can easily just use my computer to click the link and go view the um, commercial, whatever it might be. Um, 
the other thing is um, you can't use uh, like any commercials or ads that you find on YouTube through a search which names that fallacy. So you can't be like I'm I'm Google searching or YouTube searching and I'm just looking for like um, you know fallacy of ad hominem in a commercial. So like if I pull up your link and I see that it's got some uh, identifying information that lists the fallacy by name, then I won't give it credit for that. Um, I'm not saying anybody's ever done that. No, I, in fact, I don't think it has happened, but I've, I'm so, uh, I anticipate these possibilities in advance. So that's why I've stipulated this rule. Um, so yeah, I basically, it would be too easy, right? I don't want anything to be easy for you, really. I mean, at least in life, maybe things could be easy, but in this class, you need some challenges. So um, yeah, like it would be way too easy if you could just be like, oh, example of ad hominem, example of scare tactic. This is so easy. I just got to find 20 different YouTube searches. But that's not how it's going to be. So you're going to use real ads, um, and your judgment is going to be the judgment that it has got the fallacy in it. You can't be sort of routed towards it by like a classification or something like that. Okay, so any other questions about that homework? Um, if you do have any kind of questions about it or anything else, just let me know. Um, while you're thinking about that, if you put anything in the chat, uh, would I be willing to upload an example sometime? Well, sure. I actually sent you guys some videos. So in these videos, there were some pretty clear examples of such fallacies. Um, let me ask this. It's totally fine if you have been too busy, because I know we've got elections and stuff going on. It's been a hectic week. Um, has anybody, had anyone been able to check out those videos? If anyone has, let me know. Um, it's okay if you haven't. But Yes, no, whatever the answer is. I'm just checking to see if, if many of you had noticed those videos that I included, because I made um, an announcement over the weekend where I wanted to give you guys like a substitution for um, you know the Tuesday lecture. No, Alec, you may not use the videos that I sent. Absolutely not, come on, you know that. No, you can't use those videos. The whole point is that those are just given to you. And in the video, they list the fallacy. It says, hey, here's a fallacy of scare tactic. Here's a fallacy of questionable cause. I mean, no, you can't do that. Um, yeah, so it's okay if you didn't get to click them or watch, but you'll see if you look in the at least last video and also in at least one of the other videos linked in the set in the announcement, um, there's mention of like some commercials which have fallacies in them. So that can give you at least a sense of the kind of stuff to look for. But none of this should be like totally uh, like out of nowhere left field stuff. I mean, we've been studying fallacies for weeks, and as long as you've been paying attention through all of that, then I would hope you're starting to see fallacies just in the way people talk and think and you know, present arguments in everyday life. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm going to quickly, one last time, see if there's anything I didn't mention here. Let me reiterate that. Reiterate what? Uh, oh, I meant in regards to format, like a submission example. Um, there's no format. There's no, there's no required format. As long as I get all the fallacies given to me, then you'll be good. Is that to say that a link cannot lead to a YouTube clip if we find a Geico commercial? No. Okay, so let's me all be clear. You can definitely use YouTube clips, and probably some people will. But when you use the YouTube clips, they cannot be like the title of the YouTube video is ad hominem fallacy, or the title is commercial with scare tactic. You know, I'm telling you that you can't use a search which is searching for that fallacy. You just have to look for commercials. And the commercial, you, the student, are the person saying to me that it has the fallacy, but nobody else said that to you and it doesn't say that on YouTube. You understand, does that make sense, Dave? Does that kind of come, come across? Yes, it can be a picture, Jasmine. It should be pictures too, uh, like because when I used to assign this assignment when we all had like class meetings, you know, in person, um, Yes, I'll still take credit for um, for the voting. So if you have voted and you've got a way to prove it to me, then please feel free to send me that proof and I'll give you some points, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, but about Jasmine, well, Jasmine Negri, the other Jasmine, your question. Um, yes, it can be pictures because a lot of advertisements, if you just like, I don't know, open a magazine or something, have you ever done that? You know, like a cosmopolitan or like you know whatever there's a lot of fashion ads and you know it depends on the type of magazine if it's a car like uh, cars and automotive then there's going to be a bunch of car and like electronic stuff in the advertisements so you can have photos of 
pictures that you see in like printed materials where there are advertisements. It could also be video. I mean, the addition of the video uh, thing is a new thing because in every semester before this one, well, to be honest, I guess in the spring, we kind of went to remote learning halfway through, but in the, all the years before that, when I've been teaching this, the way that it used to be set up is that I would have all the students come in and I would ask students to bring a magazine. Um, and then the students I would place in groups, like you'd be with another three or four students in, in the class and I'd put you guys together with everyone's magazines and you'd basically look together as a group for fallacies and it would all be completed in one class period. So, I mean, um, it would have been a group project kind of thing. That's the way it used to be designed. But now since we can't meet and we can't, you know, all share um, stuff like that, I guess, um, it's an individual assignment and you're just going to send me that information. So you said, does it need to be two separate files or could one be fine? Okay, good question, Eduardo. Um, either way is fine, but I do insist that you have a separate document which gives me um, a sentence that explains why you think that fallacy is in that advertisement. So you have to have the ads and then companion to that is like a itemized list which tells me what fallacy was within each ad. But you know, that doesn't have to be two, two separate things, I guess. Like if you're able to write the explanation in the same document or form that you're, print, that you're providing the, the fallacy ads in, you know? So it could be one, uh, one file if you wish, that's fine. But all I'm saying is you gotta have all that information. You gotta have the, the ad itself, you gotta you know, state which fallacy you see in it, and then you have to have that one sentence explanation for each case so that I see why you're thinking that that is the fallacy. And then, you know, so if I thought that the example was not correct, if I thought the student really didn't give a correct example of that fallacy, or you didn't try to provide the explanation for it, then that could result in like some either deducted credit or, or no credit on the one example if that's the case. So just you're gonna try your best to get all 20. And you see the definitions in the book and in our previous lectures of what they each one, what each one is. Okay, um, so are we, more or less clear and good on that stuff? Just let me know if so. Then I guess we can move on for the moment. If you have any other questions about it though, as you're working on your project you know, over the weekend, feel free to just send me an email. I'm trying my best to always respond to messages within a good short window of time. There could be a few of you who've asked me questions about um, your most recent uh, quiz or some other grades. If that's the case, uh, just Hang in there. I've tried my best to reply to a bunch of them, but there may be a few outstanding that I'm going to finish up with tomorrow morning. So before the afternoon tomorrow, for sure, any outstanding emails to me about grade check or anything else, they'll be replied to. And I'm going to remind you guys again, you have to come to me for your grades. Like some people want their grades, but they're not asking for them. You have to ask for them. So when you do, you're going to get a reply from me, no problem. But you have to ask. I'm just old fashioned like that. I want you to come and get your grade. Okay. So... All right, we're good on all that. Now, we have this whole election thing going on. That's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Um, I don't know, what's the current status? I, I think that they say, you know, Trump is down, um, Biden is up, and there's some counting still to be done, but there's all possibility for, you know, shenanigans to take place because I'm not so sure whether Trump wants to honor the count. I've heard, you know, he's trying to formulate legal arguments to stop the counting, but I don't think that he'd be on very good legal ground to, to say that, you know, people who legally voted uh, should have their votes invalidated for some arbitrary reason, but then also to count them in other states where he's down and he wants those counts to, re to continue and even down recounts in other places. So it's kind of an interesting time to be an American right now with all the sort of topsy-turvy developments happening in politics and in the, uh, you know, the state, but, um, but at least the election's over. So that's a nice sigh of relief. Well, Maybe I should check myself. Is it really over or is it still kind of ongoing as we finish the tally? But um, the voting at least is over and that's a relief. The Supreme Court would not get involved in the second election in your opinion. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not so sure. The Supreme Court, of course, kind of in a way made a decision in 2000 that stopped a recount in one state. But I don't think that that's gonna be possible anything similar this time because we have um, so many states where decisive outcomes seem to favor uh, the Democrat that I believe a court case couldn't proceed because it's better and it's more viable if you have just one 
state or one jurisdiction where you can say this is where the critical recount needs to happen. But you can't say like, oh, in 10 different states all across the country where we're down, we want recounts all over the place. It's just I don't see that there's going to be a successful legal argument. But at the same time, um, you know, uh, there's a possibility for disruption, people not wanting the counts to be completed. So we all got to, I guess, hang tight and be patient as we wait for things to finish out. I mean, the main reason for all of this, as you guys probably understand, is that we're in the middle of this pandemic, right? So we have historic levels of turnout. This is the highest turnout ever in a U.S. election. Most votes ever, you know, counted. And um, people are all trying to vote, you know, by mail because they don't want to necessarily go to the polling place and break quarantine and be around other people out in public. So um, that's why it's taking longer to count these ballots because in the past, when almost everybody voted in person on the day of, it's easy to tally those because you do the signature match yourself, the voter, at the ballot box and then they just get to put it straight into the ballot count but with a mail-in ballot you know there's a signature verification process so they first have to break the envelope look at the signature match it against one that they have on file and then process it and so that just takes longer for one vote to process as opposed to the ones that are done day of and since we have this high volume now it's like you know we're at a loss to count them as quickly as we would like to get the results um yeah you say you're concerned about the next few weeks for american knee there's definitely the possibility for, uh, I guess, political violence and protest. So it's something that everyone, I guess, should be aware of and monitoring. But I do have a lot of confidence in the bedrock principles of democracy that we all kind of, I hope, agree on. And I think that um, even if people are upset with the vote, there's nothing you can do if you're, um, if you're outvoted by the other side. So I think that people are going to take this to heart and it's going to sink in over a period of days. But yeah, um, stormy waters, I guess, in a way. Um, but we'll all be all right. Pamela, you say, just out of curiosity, how do you feel about the accusations of voter fraud? There's no accusations of voter fraud that are credible, and so there's nothing to feel anyway about. There's no, no voter fraud, period. It doesn't happen. It's impossible to commit voter fraud. I mean, if you look at actual evidence, um, it's, almost, um, it's almost non-existent. It's almost zero. So, no, there's no voter fraud. Uh, that's not my feelings. That's just a fact. Um, but, of course, it may be to the political advantage of some people sometimes to make allegations of voter fraud, especially if you're losing an election. Um, no, but that's not serious, and there's no evidence of it. If there was, then the courts would take it up. But the courts don't see any merit to any such claims. Um, that's the ultimate you know, arbitration of facts. Uh, will a judge who does this for a living make judgments based on evidence? Will they agree uh, that there needs to be some type of legal intervention? But we don't see that. Already lawsuits filed in, um, in Georgia and in Wisconsin have been tossed out by the, the federal judges. So, you know, nobody ever is talking about voter fraud before this election. So, is there some kind of reason that we should think that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have a voter fraud problem? Um, well, what there is, is there's a lot of election interference by like foreign adversaries and stuff, people who get out there on social media and pose as like Americans trying to divide us against each other. Um, and then, you know, that kind of in a way ties back into the lessons that we've recently been learning about digital and media literacy. You know, the information that you take in online, you have to carefully scrutinize it. You can't just be a person who thinks anything I read from a friendly source or from a source that reinforces my beliefs is something that I should take as an absolute fact. You need to get confirmation from other sources and you need to get corroboration. Otherwise, you know, you're kind of just acting on the basis of confirmation bias and honestly uh, pursuing information. All right, well, um, we could go on and on about that stuff. I, we had a little extra time today. The, the sort of schedule has some open space in it in a way uh, because we're not necessarily scheduled to start the discussions of Chapter 12 until next time, but um, since we've gone pretty quickly through all the media and marketing stuff, I guess I was thinking to, to at least give us a sort of preview of it and start leading in a little bit to the Chapter 12 material today. And then we could just kind of go through it more slow and um, patiently. So let's try and do that. <clears throat> we'll get started just on our notes. The next and the third and final quiz of the class is on this chapter. So Chapter 12 is all about science. Um, All right, so chapter 12, the science chapter. And there's only two more chapters in the book that we're going to study overall. One is um, chapter 12 on science, and then there's also chapter 9 after that, which is all about ethics and um, morality and the idea of 
you know, moral right and wrong. So let me just start to talk to you guys a little bit about this chapter 12. Okay. So science and pseudoscience. I think that's the title of chapter 12. Opening my book, sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Science. So um, in many of the chapters of this book, they open at the beginning with like uh, some discussion of, I don't know, some like real world cases or anecdotes that, that kind of reinforce the lessons of the chapter. In chapter um, three on language, they talked about, you know, um, the Benghazi scandal and how if there had been more timely and effective communication um, under the... Obama State Department back then, and maybe we could have saved some lives and prevented, uh, you know, an attack on our embassy. In chapter four, which was the knowledge chapter, uh, there was this discussion of these horrible medical mistakes where people had the wrong leg amputated or something, um, and that was to reinforce the message that, you know, human error and errors in judgment are very real and possible for even highly skilled professionals, and therefore we should all be mindful of the fact that we can make cognitive errors and errors in judgment too. Um, and so here chapter 12 also starts off with um, some discussion of like some real world um, information to kind of bring the student a little bit more into the topic. So they talk about global warming at the beginning and, uh, and climate change. And um, so what's mentioned there are just basic facts about it that I'm sure most of you probably have heard or that you already know. For example, that <clears throat> um, because of global warming, which is a byproduct of like human um, industrial activity, uh, we are starting to have a hotter and hotter planet. You know, because of all the sort of uh, fuel emissions and carbon that gets trapped in the atmosphere from you know, fossil fuels and other industrial processes, that causes a greenhouse effect, which essentially traps heat in the planet. And um, over time, you know, it's, it's incremental, but these little changes matter because over time, as the planet gets hotter and the heating trend seems to be accelerating actually over the past, 20 years or so, um, it causes Arctic sea ice to start melting up there where we have these polar ice caps. So as the planet heats up because of trapped greenhouse gases uh, formed from you know, human activities, it causes Arctic sea ice to melt and then that causes the global sea level to rise. And so far, um, we've seen a significant amount of sea level increase uh, over the past century, uh, at least seven inches over the last 100 years. And according to like realistic models that you know predict the possible outcome into the future, even some reasonable estimates show that we could have as much as another foot of sea level rise before the end of this century, before you know 2100. And so, um, in recent decades, the heating trend has accelerated. It's probably something that you've heard about because it's definitely on the mind of a lot of people in current day society. But um, the hottest years, the hottest um, 15 years that have ever been recorded since we started keeping global meteorological data back in 1850. The hottest uh, 15 years that have ever been recorded have all been since the year 2000. And um, even closer to the current day, a lot of these hottest years ever are very recent. Like every year it seems to break a new record, either hottest or like second hottest ever. And so close to the tail end of this time graph, you would see a spike in all the global temperatures close to the current day. Um, and like I say, that's causing sea level to rise from melting Arctic ice. So it's kind of, in some cases, a disturbing thought to consider because if you imagine a worst case scenario, you can have whole coastal regions kind of um, underwater or at least eroded um, as you know that higher sea level starts to encroach on the shores. And of course, people like us, or at least like me, I live in Long Beach, and uh, you know I'm a Californian, so a lot of us are living in a coastal place in the country. Therefore, we have a concern with this. As critical thinkers, you know, we have to be able to interpret and evaluate information, scientific information that's reported in the media um, or that we encounter in school. And we have to also know how to do our own scientific um, research, or at least to know what the principles of the scientific method are. So in this chapter 12, we'll learn a little bit about the basic uh, history of science, some of the key important figures in the early history of Western science. And uh, we'll identify what are some of the basic assumptions that science makes. 
we'll talk about what are uh, the steps of the scientific method. Maybe that's something we've learned before, but we'll review that. What are the steps of the scientific method? Um, we'll talk about what makes a good scientific hypothesis. What are the qualities of a good scientific hypothesis so that you're able to distinguish between like legitimate scientific research and then stuff that's just fake or not credible. Uh, and then we will also try to talk about the difference between science and what they call um, pseudoscience. Just a quick note about the word pseudoscience. Um, that's the word pseudo means like false or or fake, right? So pseudoscience, if you break down the etymology, it literally means fake science or false science. Um, so some types of explanations of things try to appear to be scientific, but they're actually not. And uh, we have to be able to also tell the difference between like realistic, credible, empirical science, and then the other stuff that tries to be it, but it's just fake. Okay, so science. We'll start off by just giving a definition of the term. That's something that I think the text keeps doing. You know, we start the knowledge chapter with the definition of knowledge, language chapter with definition of language. So here is the science chapter, and what's the definition? Well, as they put it, it's this. It's reasoning from observable facts to testable explanations for the facts. Okay. Okay, so reasoning from observable facts to testable explanations for them. Science is all about observation of the world. Um, and by means of observing the world, we notice things. We notice that things happen. And as a scientist, you want to understand why. So science tries to provide us with explanations for the reason things happen, cause and effect explanations. Here's something. What's the cause? You know, um, Imagine that you're a primitive person that didn't live in the era of science. You would have seen stuff happening and you would have been like mystified or in some cases even scared, right? Like if you saw a volcano going off, like what is that? How did that happen? I have no idea. All I know is it's burning stuff up and it's destroying a bunch of stuff. Is this, you know, the gods or something? Is this just um, magic or whatever? So a scientist knows about like the, the geothermal properties that allow for volcanoes to erupt and to exist. Um, if you had been in primitive times and, you know, ancient days and all of a sudden, the, it's daylight and the sun is out, but what happened? All of a sudden, something's blocking the sun and it's dark during what should have been daytime. I'm talking about like a solar eclipse. Um, you might have been really confused, scared. Is this the end of the world? You know, you don't know why that's happening. You don't know the reason that that's happening. And so science gives us a lot of knowledge. And in some cases, that allows us to invent technology that makes our lives much better and more easy. Sometimes it's just so that we understand the reasons that things happen so that we can be satisfied with the explanation. Um, and so we start off by observing facts, but we don't stop there. We say, well, what is the reason for this fact? If you don't have a scientific explanation, then what's the substitute for that explanation? Just mythology, superstition, or, or nothing at all, and just total confusion. So science is important, and we really have to have healthy respect for science. It's the number one way to learn about anything in the world or in the universe. If there's something you want to know about, how does something work? Why do plants grow? Um, you know, how does the digestive system work? Why is it that... Um, we see shooting stars. Uh, how is it that the sun propagates heat and light towards us? If there's anything you're interested in knowing and you want to get a real credible answer, the best place to go would be to see the current scientific consensus theory of it. Um, so it's the major source and method for gaining knowledge about the world. If we didn't have science, all of us would be way worse off. We couldn't be having this discussion right now because it wouldn't be all this technology because nobody would have ever discovered it. They would never know how these things work. We would not know how electricity works, how telecommunications work. Global satellite systems work, you know, um, defense systems, transportation, and the list goes on and on. You know, even the glasses that I'm wearing, these are not things that are found in nature. These have to be created according to principles of how to form a lens and how that interacts with the workings of the eye. So whether it's biology, chemistry, physics, um, uh, there's so much knowledge in the world of science, and we oftentimes take it for granted, you know, we, we benefit from all the things that science has established and allowed us to learn. But um, now we're going to try and take a deeper look and really think about it critically and 
and uh, in more detail. So I'm going to next move on from here to just talk about the scientific revolution a little bit. <clears throat> so about the scientific revolution in history, um, we haven't always lived in this modern era, obviously. Um, prior to around like the 17th century, um, it was the medieval period. And then before that, it was the early Christian era. And until around the 16th and 17th century, like the late Renaissance and then what some call the age of reason that follows right after that, um, there wasn't a lot of secular or scientific knowledge that had really become widespread. Because in the history of the West, if you go tracing us back to like year zero, you know, beginning of the common era, the dates and times associated with the life of you know, Jesus Christ and stuff, if you go back to the beginning of the common era, the early Christian era all the way up through like the 13th and 14th century was dominated by religious thought and by the church. So it wasn't like today where we have a separation of church and state and uh, people are free, of course, to practice whatever religion or faith that they want according to their beliefs. Uh, but we still have a separation where you get a, a, a secular education that doesn't presuppose one or another religious perspective or we have, you know, um, scientific researchers who are not doing the research in an effort to glorify religion or anything, but just to understand things on a cause and effect level. Well, back in the day, the church was fused together with the state and it kind of jointly administered many of the functions of the state, whether it was education, you'd be getting a religious education, whether it was, you know, um, people in high positions of power, a lot of these people were also church leaders. So what I'm telling you is that it really wasn't until around the late Renaissance and then the 17th century, the age of reason, that science started to kind of expand its influence and become a bigger deal and a more powerful um, source of knowledge for, for people, everyday folk. And there's some interesting figures in that early age of reason and scientific um, you know, growth period. So one of them is this guy, Nicholas Copernicus. Yeah, Nicholas Copernicus. So this man, uh, what is his life all about? So he lived from 1473 until 1543. And um, who was he? Well, he was a Polish astronomer. Um, who made a very important discovery. And some people consider this to be like a revolutionary discovery that helps to sort of jumpstart the modern era and this, you know, scientific era that we're kind of living in. He was a Polish astronomer who um, discovered heliocentrism. And this idea of heliocentrism um, this replaced geocentric. Okay, now, uh, maybe you already know a little bit about this history, or maybe you can just, um, maybe you have a good vocabulary and you've heard the words heliocentrism or geocentrism, or maybe you're just a good um, logical reasoner and you have a sense of what these words mean by just thinking of some of the parts of the words that you're familiar with. But I don't know, I would ask you if you could throw out a guess. What do you think that means in other words, what's written there on the board? What is it in other words in maybe more fulsome detail? What do you think this man discovered? And what did it replace? What do you think is heliocentrism? And what do you think it is that it replaced geocentrism? What could that be? Even if it's a guess, I'd love to see your guess. So let me know. Heliocentrism, anybody? Any guesses? Okay, so Jasmine, he discovered that the sun is at the center of the solar system as opposed to the Earth. That's right, good, yes. Helio means sun, centrism means centered at the middle, so placed in the center. So yeah, heliocentrism was the view that the sun was the center of our solar system, but as much as it seems obvious to us today, like we just, we take that for granted, it's an objective fact, nobody doubts that in 2020. But back in whatever, like 1500, this was not at all accepted. It was uh, actually considered to be um, contrary to the doctrines of the church and the orthodoxy of, of uh, you know, of the church. So 
they believed in geocentrism. What do you think is geocentrism? Well, good, me, yes, you already have it. Geocentrism is the belief uh, that it is the Earth that's at the center of the solar system. Uh, and actually more than that, uh, to, to the early Christian uh, generations, it was believed that um, the Earth was the center of the whole universe. Now, why did, does anybody have a thought about why it was so important to insist on the, the point that the Earth is in the middle of everything? And why do you think it was considered so problematic for Mr. Uh, Copernicus to say otherwise? Um, why do you think it was important to religious thought of the time to consider the Earth to be in the center of the universe? What could be the reason for that if you, you, know, if you were to some, somehow just make a guess about that? <clears throat> there had to be a reason, because literally people were threatened with death if they said otherwise. They would say, you better stop that. And they forced them to recant their testimony. Not just Copernicus, but also Galileo, perhaps a more well-known figure, but um, Copernicus is also um, even more important perhaps on this. So because it was thought that God created the earth first, yes, essentially, pretty much, Jasmine, the belief was this. God, according to the book of Genesis, creates the universe with mankind foremost in his mind. Because the church believed that uh, we are not just random things that just somehow found uh, evolution through a long, drawn-out process, and just here we are on this random, non-specific planet. The belief was, no, 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 God created the heavens and earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and within that whole first seven days, you know, he created man. And he wanted to make man in his image. We're the children of God, right? And therefore, we're supposed to have this kind of a central position. If we're the point and the reason for the whole universe to exist, this is the sort of religious paradigm that the universe exists, but not for no reason, because God wanted to create mankind and place us here. So if that's the case, then you'd expect him to put us right in the center of everything, right? Everything should revolve around mankind if we're the point of the whole universe ex existing. So it would have been considered very dismissive of cherished beliefs um, and religious ideals to say that we're not in the middle of everything. So when Copernicus was using these newly invented telescopes, right, we talked about glasses. Well, telescopes and lenses were a relatively new historical, uh, you know, invention. And at this time, we're starting to have more powerful telescopes. So you could use those to more accurately observe the orbits and the celestial motions of the local solar system. And so that's technology that didn't exist in the centuries before. But using these and conducting detailed observations over a long span of time, Copernicus was able to prove that it, we're not in the middle, that we are rotating around the sun, and um, it's not the other way around. Galileo also found the same thing using similar type of observation with telescopes. In the case of Galileo, he was persecuted pretty hardcore by the church. So they said to him, he was like in his 70s. Back then, he was a very well-aged you know, aged person. You'd think, respect your elders and all of that, but no, they said to him, uh, we're gonna execute you if, if you don't go out in public and tell everybody that you're possessed by the devil or something, that you're making this stuff up because we can't have people starting to think that the earth's not at the middle of everything. They'll never believe the church again. They'll, they'll stop reading the Bible. So they threatened him, and they had a lot of power. So he did that. Galileo, you know, afraid for his life, he went out and he recanted all his testimony. And he said, I don't know why I said that. We're not in the middle. And it took centuries, but... Um, Today, even, you know, the, the church, the Catholic church and everything fully well accepts that, at, in fact, that is correct, that the earth's not in the center and it is the sun. So this is like an undisputed thing that's now been proven by much more powerful methods of proof and, and more powerful, you know, technologies to prove it. Um, and there's been like formal apologies issued to like the descendants of Galileo by the church. So in the long span of history, um, you know, the scientific uh, researchers were shown to have the right information and the right research to back it up. Uh, but back then, it wasn't the world we're living in today. So can you imagine that, being threatened with death, just for saying something as simple as, the Earth's not the center of the universe? Um, there were some loyalists to the church that were also uh, scientists, and some of them were told, come up with some type of uh, model of the planetary orbits that places the earth at the center. Can you just rig some kind of description of the universe that will give us that outcome? And um, there was this one person who actually tried to do that. His name was Ptolemy. So with a silent P at the beginning, 
Ptolemy, basically, you start by pronouncing the letter T in that. But what Ptolemy did was he said, okay, there's one way that we can um, interpret the observations through the telescopes, which still implies that the Earth is in the middle. But for that to work, we would have had to assume that while we are at rest, all these other planets are moving around us in what are called epicycles, okay? So epicycles are like corkscrew, curly Q patterns of motion. And from the position on the Earth, the only way that it would look like the other planets are rotating around us is if you presuppose that they're not moving in smooth elliptical orbits, but that they're moving around us in corkscrew patterns called epicycles, which is, of course, not the most elegant or parsimonious theory, and we know that's not true also. Even Johann Kepler, that came a few centuries later, was able to prove that planets move around a central point in an elliptical orbit because they're falling in the free fall of space and being bounded by the effect of gravity to the other objects. So they fall in these smooth ellipses and it's nothing at all to do with um, the corkscrew pattern. But that just shows you that if you try really hard enough, you can sometimes interpret data to fit a favored hypothesis. So Ptolemy is like a great, you know, sort of early modern era example of confirmation bias. You're looking for any kind of way to justify the position that you already are hoping to prove, which is that it's the Earth that's at the middle. Okay, so yeah, Copernicus, we owe a debt of gratitude to him and also to Galileo um, for sort of, in a way, jump-starting um, this era where we have more trust and reliance on scientific information. And, um, and it's a good thing, right? Because again, like I say, we wouldn't have all these medicines, all these technologies, telecommunication tools, and even this class meeting, none of these things would exist if it wasn't for the intervention into nature by scientists and scientific research. Um, some people even refer to the groundbreaking discovery of heliocentrism as like the Copernican revolution. I studied in grad school with this one um, philosopher who, who, he wrote a book uh, called Kant's Copernican Revolution. Now, don't, never mind Kant, actually we'll talk about him in a few weeks when we get to the chapter nine material. But um, he wanted to give that title because it was sort of like a shout out to the prime importance and the sort of revolutionary impact of, uh, of Copernicus' discovery there. Okay, <clears throat> so that's Copernicus. Now, another important figure in the early um, Western science is uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Okay, now his dates were from 1561 until uh, 1626. That's when he lived. And his contribution, his legacy, um, is that he discovered, well, I don't know if I should say discovered, but kind of created the, the processes uh, or the steps of the scientific method. So he's the guy who formulated um, the steps of the scientific method. So first formulated the steps of the scientific method. Okay, so there's like a precise methodology to doing scientific research. You start off by just observing the world and collecting data, and you see that some phenomena exists. That's the first step, just seeing that something is happening. And the scientist from there wants to try and understand why is it happening, so they give a hypothesis. The hypothesis is like an initial educated guess to try and explain the reason behind why something happened. Um, after that, there's a test that's designed. So you try and design an experiment or a test which can put the hypothesis to the test. So the test will basically be capable of either proving the hypothesis or disconfirming it. And then after that, you know, if you have confirmed the hypothesis with the experiment, you would then report that to the scientific community and the rest of the world, and hopefully they agree. And if they can replicate your findings, then it looks like we've got the correct explanation for the phenomenon. Um, and so those steps, which are pretty familiar to us probably because I think even very basic science lessons that you probably have had in earlier levels of school, they always talk about how the scientific method is just a bedrock method by which we um, learn anything about reality. So I gave the case earlier of like, I don't know, um, a volcano erupts. If it was a scientist sees that, they would be like, okay, what could be the explanation? So they might suppose that there's one set of physical factors that would lead to that. And then if they can somehow reproduce those assumed factors in like a controlled setting, like a laboratory, or even a real world setting perhaps, 
then they could see if that is going to lead to the outcome predicted by the theory or by the hypothesis. And if it does, then we gain experimental confirmation for that explanation. Um, let's see, I remember learning something about like an old school science experiment. This is something that's way back in my memory from like middle school or something, but I remember learning if I'm correct, that this was something that was actually experimented on way back in the time of Francis Bacon. And it's, it's in a way a reminder of how far we've come in terms of what we know, but um, okay, so let me just throw this out there. Suppose like if you had some food that was just out that you left out in the open and in the open air it starts to rot and then maggots and stuff start to like consume the food. So that would be really gross. You know, you look at this like discarded hamburger on the street or something or in a trash can and you see like a bunch of little maggots all around it. Okay, so people back in Francis Bacon time would have seen that. They did see that. And some people had this um, kind of incorrect idea but they didn't know it was incorrect. Like some people, they looked at these maggots and they're like, where are they coming from? I don't see how they got there. And they thought that it would actually be the food itself, that somehow if it's left to spoil, it starts to turn into these gross looking pests. So they thought that somehow food itself, um, you know, transmogrified into this weird, almost like life form, um, but they weren't sure. So let me ask you, if you were going to try and test whether or not, so you're trying to test right now this hypothesis. Food left out to spoil turns into maggots. That's the hypothesis. How could a person test that? What do you think? What would be the way of testing it? What would be your materials that you would need? I'm just throwing that out at you to see if we can think about the scientific method by using a real example for a moment. Okay, leave out food. That's good. You got to leave out the food because we want to see what's going to happen, but uh, what next? You leave out the food, but here's the question. Does it come from the food itself, these maggots, or does it not? The, the hypothesis is that the food will turn into maggots. So you need a secure box and the food. Good, Aaron. Um, so what are you gonna do with the secure box and the food? Just give me a little detail, just a follow-up question say a secure box with food. Lily, you'd put the food under the container in order to ensure that outside matter cannot interact in a way that would disrupt the findings. Very good, right. So, you know, um, by placing it in an impermeable barrier, like, I mean, today uh, that would be like saran wrap or like aluminum foil or something, but of course back then I don't know what they would have used. Anyway, you seal it off. You make sure that the food is kept in a container that's sealed, right? And then what would you do? You would uh, let time pass, let the food spoil, and if your hypothesis is correct, and when you unseal this, what should you see? Well, you should see that it's a bunch of maggots there. But if your hypothesis is incorrect, and that's not the reason that these maggots form, then leaving it sealed should show that the food was not capable of changing on its own. And that, of course, is what was discovered. So, you know, we know now, and I mean, it's very obvious, I guess, to me, and I would hope to you also, that the real reason for that is just the depositing of larvae by passing insects often going unnoticed by people, even if they were closely observing the food that was left off. Um, and then, of course, that can lead to the genesis of the observed phenomenon. So, anyways, in science, a hypothesis is suggested to explain some observed fact. And then we don't just leave it at, I think I know why it happened, we have to test it. So you find a way to get a controlled setting where you can uh, have a dependent variable that is going to see whether or not the predicted effect of the hypothesis occurs. In this case, we control the factor as to whether or not this food has access to the outside environment. And if the claim that it comes from the food itself is true, then leaving it unable to gain you know, any outside um, access should allow it to turn into that. Okay, anyway, that's Sir Francis Bacon. So we also, I guess, owe him some respect and credit for helping us along with the precision of stating the scientific method. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk to you guys now about is just what are some of the basic assumptions that are built into science? Like what are that um, science kind of has to presuppose to even to even be scientific research or to even do that? So assumptions behind science. Okay, so. The first one mentioned in the book is, this, is an assumption, um, is a concept that we've already kind of touched on in this semester a few times. 
um, because it was relevant also to chapter uh, four on the topic of, of knowledge. So um, this is empiricism. And now maybe since you've learned this um, at least one time, who could tell me what is empiricism? It's a certain viewpoint about where most of our knowledge is coming from. But what is, what is it again? Something that's already appeared one time in our class. So I would just say, what is it? What's empiricism? You got your memory, got your notes, some, some way I'm sure that you can tell me what that is. What is empiricism? I'll just wait for a minute and let you tell me. Is it that it comes from what we can see here and touch? Yeah, Aaron, good. So it's the view that most of our knowledge comes from the, the way that we can use our five senses to observe the world, right? So um, maybe it wouldn't be the claim that all but most anyway. Yeah, most human knowledge. knowledge comes from uh, the five senses and observation. Okay, so now why is that like a bedrock assumption of science that, that we, we assume empiricism to be true according to uh, science? Well, because science itself is all about using observation to collect data about the world, form hypotheses about those things, and then test them. So if we could not gain knowledge by means of our five senses and observation, then science wouldn't work because that's the main tool of science, to use observation and then try and explain the things that we do observe. But things that can't be observed are of no concern to science. Um, Things that cannot be tested are of no concern to science. And so there's a basic orientation in the whole methodology of science to, to suppose that we can learn things by using observation and our five senses. What are the five senses? So there's sight, taste, touch, hearing, and smell. Um, sometimes in science, we directly observe using just our sense organs, you know, our eyes, our ears, our nose, and whatever, um, our hands. In other cases, we have got instruments and tools that enhance the ordinary powers of perception through the five senses that we have. So you all know like a microscope allows you to have a more powerful case of vision than you could have unaided without the microscope or telescope, right? Um, another case, I don't know, you're trying to hear things. Um, maybe you can use a stethoscope or some type of other audio enhancement that goes beyond the powers of your ordinary ear or magnifies its ability to hear things. Um, so the five senses sometimes are supplemented by technologies and tools that make them more precise or powerful. Um, but that's the basic method by which science proceeds. We look at stuff, we examine things using the five senses or the tools that enhance them. And then we try to discover the facts and the reasons why they happen. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking, is there much else I can say about empiricism? Not much. I mean, it's opposed to rationalism, which is the idea that uh, most of our knowledge comes from just abstract ideas and pure reason. Um, but yeah, scientists, they, they do empirical investigation. And empirical investigation is just a sort of way of talking about the, the studies that we do when we form uh, or when we're, when we're claiming empiricism to be true. Empirical evidence is just evidence that can be observed by the five senses. Now, sometimes there are things that are difficult to directly observe. Um, like if they're too small or, you know, with quantum particles and stuff, trying to observe them changes properties about them. So that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but in some cases we can indirectly observe things even when they're not directly observable. So like we could create a cloud chamber and then observe the properties of a elementary particle, which passes through the cloud chamber. So sometimes, or, I don't know, we use night vision goggles, and then maybe that gives us an ability to see things in the night that we otherwise might not have been able to see. So just a reminder that um, these tools that we've been able to develop that allow us to more 
um, in a more widespread way, observe more things that we couldn't do before. That's that's part of the benefit, I guess, of living in this modern time. Okay, so empiricism is one of the big assumptions, basic assumptions of science. <clears throat> now here's another one, and it's the idea of what's called objectivity. Okay, so um, what do you think? Let's see. What do you think um, it is to be objective? What do you think that means? What is objectivity? Anybody have a thought? Maybe you've heard the word or you kind of have a vague idea even, maybe how it's used. Objectivity. What could that be? Or what is, look at things without bias, okay? And Kyle, you say to be correct. These are both, I think, fair ways to say it or sort of two angles of the same idea. To look at solely facts, okay, good, Eduardo, yes. So let me bring all these points together and give you a concise definition. Um, or actually one more thing before I say that. So Pamela, you say to not judge information based on current culture. Well. Yes, to be free of bias is sometimes what people mean when they speak to be objective. But um, it's like more having to do with just getting the facts correct um, without error, you know. So, um, Ryan, not influenced by personal feeling or opinion. Sure, right? So looking at something objectively and not allowing your bias to prevent you from seeing things as they actually are. Not, let's say, having a favored hypothesis, which you refuse to discount even when... Uh, obvious facts seem to, to show otherwise. That's one way of looking at it, so being free of bias. Sometimes in a bigger picture sense, philosophers and scientists talk about it as just the possibility of getting things correct and factually true. Um, oftentimes, objective is contrasted with subjective. So let's see if we have a handle on how these words are sometimes used. If I tell you that vanilla is just the best ice cream out there, would you say that that sentence or that statement is subjective or is that an objective claim? Or, I, I mean, subjective or an objective statement, let's say it that way, that vanilla is the best ice cream. Okay, it's subjective, right. And why is it subjective? Well, it's because it's sort of my own taste. It's, I mean, it's my personal preference and my opinion. But it's not like there's an objective fact about what's the best ice cream because it is just a matter of taste and preference. Um, if I tell you, you know, Adidas are better than Nike's, you know, that could be my opinion. That could be something that I feel, but maybe other people don't feel, and we could just have different opinions about it. But um, can anybody tell me something that they think would count as an objective statement, and it's not subjective at all, like an objective fact? So it won't be something about what's the best ice cream or what's the best movie um, or, you know, who's the best artist. What would be like an objective fact? Sky is blue. Uh, pretty good, yes, celestial shadows, I think so. But to be honest, though, when it comes to color, there's all kinds of variability in different visual systems. So if I was colorblind, I might look up there and it might look a different color. Or, um, you know, at nighttime, it's not even blue. It's black. Um, water is a source of hydration. The earth is covered mostly by water. Okay, these are all good things. And I didn't want to – I'm not discounting the blue example. I'm just – you know, I'm a philosopher, so I always got to probe for, like, the one possible, uh, you know – tricky counterexample to anything that is suggested to me, but um, the election's not over yet. That is objectively true, yes. Well, I mean, the votes are in, so you could say that the votes have been cast, but yeah, the, the tallying is not done. Humans are mammals. Yes, they are. Live birth and uh, warm-blooded. Um, humans need water and able to survive, or they could drink a lot of soda, Caesar. You know, you could just get by on soda for a while, I think, um, but I know you need, you need liquids or whatever. Um, so anyway, yeah, good. Um, if I told you that the Earth is the third planet from the sun, that's not just how I feel today or my, like, you know, my taste or my preference. That's just an objective fact. If I tell you that there's, um, you know, that the square root of 81 is 9, that's not just, like, my opinion. That's an objective fact concerning the, you know, concept of number. Um, you know, if I say to you right now that, um, I don't know, um, Helium is lighter than iron on the periodic table. I mean, that's just something that's an objective fact. It's measurable. It's known um, because we can, can we can you know find out the atomic weights of the different elements there. So anyway, um, there are objective facts and there are subjective things that are just 
preferences, personal opinions, feelings. Scientists believe that we can get to the objective truth, that we can learn about the world as it really is. So let me give the definition and I'll continue the discussion. So this is the belief that <clears throat> Learn about reality as it really is. And without bias. Okay, so science believes in objectivity. They believe it's possible for us to get to the truth. That there is a real factual, real world out there. That the world outside of your mind is not just like something imaginary, um, the moon and stuff, it's still there when you're not thinking about it. And before you were born, it was there. And after you're gone, it's still going to be there. So like there's an objective world out there that does not get created by your mind. There's a mind independent world. So the, the world that you're in, this screen that you're looking at, it's not a big dream. It's not just something that's created by thoughts and feelings. It's a real factual system. Um, and you can learn about it. That's what scientists believe. If we didn't think that we could learn about reality as it really is, if we just thought, oh, we're all trapped in our own perspectives and none of us can actually discover the, the ground truth of things, then there would be no point to doing science, right? If science could at best tell us about how some people feel and how other people feel and there's just no objective difference between the two, then it would kind of be uh, meaningless, right? We're trying to discover the truth. Science holds that as a goal, but it thinks of it as an achievable goal. And so that's what objectivity is about. The belief that we can do this, that we can learn about reality as it really is, and that we can get to that truth without bias. So scientists don't think they're just talking about their personal opinions or feelings, but rather that they're getting to the truth of things, whether they feel good about them or like them or don't like them. Um, so objectivity, the main assumption of science. We're not just talking about personal preferences, etc., but rather the objective facts, which we think exist which we think we're capable of discovering by using our reason. And that's part of what it is to be a good critical thinker, too. Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes it's hard for people to believe in objective truths. I understand because, you know, we live in this postmodern era where we have a healthy dose of tolerance, and we should. We should all, I think, be respectful of all the various opinions, walks of life, lifestyles, perspectives that people have. And that's a good thing. But um, you also have to recognize that even though that's true, you're still in a factual, objective universe. It's not like a universe made up by uh, the, the thoughts and opinions of people, but rather just by the objective facts. Okay, so anyways then, um, I had, a, I had a, a saying told to me by one of my advisors back in grad school. I don't know why, but I always think of it when I get to these discussions in the class. It's something like this, um, have an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> Uh, so it's sort of like, yeah, be open-minded to all the different views, but understand that there's still some things that are just objectively true. And if you have an open mind to changing your view about those things, then you're going to do the wrong thing. Okay. So anyway, assumptions behind science. Another one is the assumption of what's called materialism. Now, with the word materialism... Uh, that's one of the labels that it has, but there's another term that's synonymous with it that I also want to put on the board. So it's sometimes also called physicalism. Now, to me, this would be a better and more accurate label to use. The book prefers materialism, and it's okay because, yes, that, that is the way that some refer to this. But we talked earlier in the semester about equivocation, right? Equivocation is when there's a single word with more than one meaning and the meaning can change in the course of an argument or in a discussion. Well, materialism has more than one sense or one, more than one meaning. And one of the meanings of the term materialism has nothing to do with science at all. It's, uh, it's, and it's probably the, the sense of it that you're more familiar with from your just everyday life. Has anybody ever heard the word materialism in, in another context outside of this class? Like what is a materialistic person um, according to one understanding of the term? If you, if you know, I don't know. Materialism, this person believes in materialism or this person's materialistic. Have you ever heard that description? If so, I don't know, do you know what it means or have a thought? 
because that's not the, that's not the definition of this kind of materialism. But I want to disambiguate, so I want to make sure that no one's going to be uh, confused by that other unrelated meaning. Okay, so Jasmine, someone who only cares about physical objects they own, right? Yeah, so that's not the kind of materialism that's being mentioned here. But I wanted to set that aside so that we can all be clear that there's the um, the scientific and philosophical concept of materialism in, in this context, but it has no bearing or relationship to materialism, meaning um, I'm only obsessed with possessions, how I look, um, money, clothes, you know, items. That's not the kind of materialism that we are now defining in this class. So please just keep it in your vocabulary, but not in this sense. That's why I prefer the other label, because this only has the one, like, meaning, and it doesn't have any ability to be misinterpreted or equivocated on. But anyway, yeah, so but what is the scientific philosophical materialism? It's this perspective. It's the idea that it's the belief that everything in the universe is made out of physical matter, including even us and our consciousness. So that's the, that's the viewpoint. <clears throat> Actually, this will be better, so I'm going to put it down. Everything in the universe... Uh, including, and this is key, including us and um, our consciousness. Okay, so materialism slash aka um, physicalism is the view that everything in the universe, everything, not just most things, not just like 99% of things, Every single thing, everything, 100% of everything is made, is literally formed, built out of physical matter. And including, okay, even us, even us, me and you, all the human beings, all the life forms, everything in the universe, living things, non-living matter, it's all just made out of physical matter. Um, even us in our consciousness. So the fact that you're a conscious being, like that you're not just a table or a chair just sitting there like an object, but you're a subject. You can see, you can feel, you can hope, dream, per perceive. Um, you, know, you, can per you can sense pain, pleasure, have memories. Think right now about your mom or something. You got like mental images you can form. So that's very interesting to be a human and any life form that has consciousness. But the point of materialism is saying that even all that stuff, the sort of the inner inside life of the mind, right? That's also just made out of matter. It's all just made out of physical matter. Now, let's think about physics for just a half second. What is the most, um, the smallest unit of matter that people often refer to? The terminology for like the, the, the least bit of physical matter. So after you've divided things down and down and down, you get to this. Okay, the atom, that's good, uh, Taya, yes, and same Jasmine. Um, well, I see you're saying cells, Pamela. Right. Cells would be the most tiniest part of a, of a biological material, like a, we're formed out of cells. But to be honest, you can go further down than the cell, because even inside the cell, you have mitochondria, DNA, and you have other, you have the nucleus. So we can break that down into its atomic um, composition if you go down further. Some people talk about subatomic particles. I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily go there. There are quarks and all those things, but um, but for the most part, historically, classically, the term for the smallest physical piece of matter is the atom. That goes way back to the Greeks. Um, the word atom, T-O-M in Greek, has to do with being able to be cut. And uh, A, the prefix, is like not. So like, you know how they say like um, uh, an atheist, that's like not a theist. Um, an asexual, like not sexual uh, orientation or something. Um, so atom actually literally means, if you go way back, um, uncuttable, can't be cut, can't be further divided into smaller parts, it's not further subdivisible. So anyway, um, that's the atom. And according to materialism, or maybe I prefer this term, physicalism, the idea, in other words, is that everything's made out of atoms. Everything is just a bunch of atoms grouped together into various different objects. So you see this expo marker? 
what is it at, at the ultimate level? It's just a bunch of atoms bundled together, forming this marker in space. And what am I and what are you? I mean, we are these um, human organisms and we've got this mass and weight and volume that we're formed out of atoms too. And everything about the thoughts that you have and the feelings that you experience and the dreams and hopes, everything else, it's all just atoms grouped together to form a life form that exhibits consciousness. Um, now, another kind of implication of the physicalist viewpoint is that like, it implies that there's no such thing as the soul. It implies that there's no possibility for consciousness to exist apart from in the physical body where the brain functions. Because according to physicalism, it's not like it's because of the existence of the soul or spirit or a ghost in the machine that you have this perception and consciousness. It would simply be because of the functioning of the physical brain. And so if there's no brain that's functioning, or if it's been destroyed through decomposition, as, as of course is inevitable going to happen, then there wouldn't be consciousness and it couldn't possibly survive, right? Like it would deny the possibility of a disembodied consciousness, just kind of floating free from a body as if that could be supported apart from a functioning brain. You know, so like, I mean, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with the physicalist, but sort of to play the advocate for the position they would say something like, okay, I mean, see this marker, again, to use it as an example, can we agree that this marker does not have consciousness? Like, this, mar there's nothing it's like to be this marker. It's not like happy, sad, feeling anything, judging anything. It's not looking at the lecture, being like, what an interesting topic these people are talking about. The marker is not a conscious object. It's an inanimate object. And why is that? Well, because it doesn't have a brain or a central nervous system, so it cannot possibly have the neurological function to produce consciousness. But then me and you do have the consciousness. Now, what's the difference between me and you and the marker? Uh, it would appear to be because we have the physiological structure to support consciousness, and the marker doesn't. So where there's a brain and a functioning nervous system, you can have consciousness. But when there isn't, or it's been broken down or destroyed over time, then consciousness won't happen. So, you know, um, many people say that science and religion are not like good bedfellows, that they have tensions, contradictions with each other. And to be honest, there's a fair, reasonable reason to think that, because if you're going to be a very thoroughgoing scientific realist or physicalist, as they sometimes call it, then you would not have the room in your belief system to accept the uh, idea of the supernatural, of the soul, or any of those things. Um, some people think that's kind of a little bleak and depressing. I guess they want to live forever and have an afterlife. But, you know, if there is an afterlife, I don't think knowing this fact about science could change that. So you're good either way. Um, all right, so there's a little more to say, but does anybody have any thought or comment or anything else to add? Um, because I don't want to rush through too many of the notes since we have so much additional time to cover chapter 12. So I may just kind of cut us right here, and then we can resume on Tuesday when we come back after the weekend. But anything um, on your guys' mind, or is everything cool? Are we good? Let me know just one time in the chat if you have anything to add, to say, or anything else. If you feel like you're good, um, and this material has come through at least somewhat clear, then um, then we can just call the time for now. Okay, thanks, Lily. I just wanted that little feedback from any of you guys. Yeah, thanks, good. Thanks, everybody. Um, have a great weekend. You know, uh, try to stay healthy and sane. If anybody's messaging me, please do about your um, assignments if you want to know about anything, and I'll help you understand your grade. It could take me a day or so as I'm looking at a lot of emails now, but before the end of the weekend, for sure, I'll get to everything that you send me if you do send me something. Okay, well then, have a great day, and I'll see you guys uh, soon. Have a good weekend. Thank you.